So we started working on October 5th, and we're still holding true to 18 months. It's a reasonable timeline. It's actually somewhat aggressive. But like all people, we want to beat that time, and we want to find ways in which we can come out earlier than what is expected. But we're sticking with 18 months. We're doing the work. We're staffing up. We're setting priorities, and we're really looking at what our regulations should do so that it can support growth, opportunity, and innovation. So we are hoping licensing. And so what I also want to bring to your attention is that we're, we're really talking about that we have an ecosystem. We cannot issue licenses and tell people to go open a store if we don't have products available for them to sell. We can't tell people to go and open a store if there's no opportunity for financing. We can't tell them to go open a store and to grow the product if we don't have um, infrastructure in place to support grows. This is an ecosystem. All of these things have to align and they must be set up together so that they work in tandem. That's what we're trying to do with the regulations as well as with our planning schedule. So yes, it is a huge lift and we want to do it. At this point, you haven't filled the application that has yet to be released. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, but seriously, this is a business like every other business. What, what I keep in, um, encouraging people to do is to realize where you fit in to create your business plan and to be ready to rock and roll as soon as those applications become available. So there are no qualifications for a grower other than they have a plan to execute. Because I can't tell you that you just because you've never grown that you can't be a grower. You have to figure out what you want to grow. It's like saying if you've never owned a coffee shop. I owned a coffee shop, and that's why I'm using it as an example. But if you don't know what you want to sell, you have to have an idea of what you want to do and what you want to, what makes sense for you and what's going to be profitable for your business. Oh, no, no, no. That's right. All, that's right. all licensed products will be tested. And so that's one, of the, that's one of the reasons that we have to have a regulated market. New York State is the largest um, cannabis market in the world right now. The largest, larger than California. We're just not regulated. So people don't know where it's grown, how it's grown, what it's cleaned with, what they're actually smoking, what they're ingesting. So it's not about me telling you which strains of the plant, because that's sort of where your question is going. That's no, not our that's job. Not, not we are gonna tell you the, what your requirements are to pr produce a safe, product. That's it. That's what I'm getting at. What are the qualifications and what are the regulations? I mean, anyone can, it's like every, a drug dealer. Everybody has a drug. Some, some people put fentanyl in it. So, I'm just what saying. I'm going to say is, what I'm going to say is, we cannot tell you that anything beyond we will be testing and once we re reproduce the regulations, because if I sat here and tried to tell you what all of the regulations are for testing of the plant, they would be wrong. I just can't remember all of that. And that's another business and structure, labs? Labs, I was going to gonna say, there, that is something that we already have in the state, and we will be utilizing some of the existing labs, because all of our medical uh, marijuana products are tested. And I can't tell you exactly what all of the testing is, but we have the standards, and those are already written. And so if you want to take a look at what the standard is in testing for either hemp or medical marijuana, those are already available to us, and those can be guides. But anybody can grow that wants to grow, and then they will have to meet the, state, the testing standards in order for their products to go to sale. No, and I, so I, I appreciate that question because I think everyone is trying to read the tea leaves in this moment. And unfortunately, we're asking you to be a little bit patient while we develop the regulations because we are trying to do something new in New York. We are trying to center equity. We are trying to make sure that we provide access. We're trying to time ourselves so that the market makes sense when people enter it. We've seen many examples across no, numerous states where people got licenses and they had to sit on them for months, and in some cases, years. We don't want that. We don't want people entering into lease agreements and they, have, they don't have a business to operate. 
We don't want people looking for product and there's none available, and we don't want the market oversaturated. So these are real things. We also don't want people to not know how they're gonna move their money. Like there's some things that are really simple in the business, but that we still need to think about. So we have to think about standard operating procedures. We have got to think about how banking affects us. What is insurance going to What's going to happen with your insurance? What happens if you've got a mortgage on the building that you thought you were going to a lease to somebody that's a cannabis business? We're trying to make sure that we can help folks through all of these challenges and figure out the solutions. But it's, also, but it's all happening at the same time. So we're building as we walk. And that's part of, that's a, that is somewhat of a challenge, but it is what we're doing in this world. So I'm gonna say it is, and it's gonna be the work of our assembly member and people similarly situated like her, who are doing the work to make sure that they're engaging community. It's two chicks in um, flower, engaging community so that you are ready when applications are available and your business models are viable because that's really what it's about in this moment for us we're trying to set people up so that they are ready to pounce when as soon as they become available with viable business models um we have we've watched illinois and we know that it's sad we also know it's a wild wild west in oklahoma we've seen people just hit challenge after challenge we're deliberately paying attention to those challenges. We're listening and watching how people move in those spaces. We're looking to see how and who are lending money in other, in other states so that we know what to prepare ourselves for and arm people against in some cases. So we're hoping that the preparatory work is what's going to make sure that we don't fall prey to the same problems. But I think this, these kinds of conversations are what's gonna get us ahead so that people know that they can really create a business that's gonna be viable. No, it's 50% of all licenses. Let me okay, be really clear, because everybody you. always has this conversation like, black folk just supposed to sell. Yeah. We're not, this is not a liquor store model. Yeah. This is an industry, and I really want people to know and understand that it is 50% of all licenses, all license types. Okay. So if you're setting up a co-op, a micro business, if you're cultivating, if you are going to be a distributor, or if you're doing delivery service and consumption, all of it, we need to make sure we have people in all parts of this industry. But the thought was that, I'm sorry, but the, the thought is that if you had the micro license, it was targeted to people getting an opportunity because you don't need as much capital to get in, right? I don't know who told you that you don't need as much because you have to do your own processing. Yes. That's so, correct, but, but, so what I'm saying is I don't know whose thought yeah. we think that we're capturing, but having sat in the legislature and had an opportunity to be a part of some of these conversations, I can tell you that I did not think when I said that we want to make sure that we have social equity applicants be a part of this, that we were thinking that they're only going to be um, restricted to one segment of this. Because what I also want to remind us is, we've got to broaden our view of who we think social equity is, and who they are, and how they operate. They are not all waiting for us to come and lead them to something. They are not people that don't have ideas of their own, or don't know how to move money, or raise money, or operate businesses. They know these things. And they are very capable people. And many of them have access to cash and to capital. So I don't want us to, when we think narrow, we think they're thinking narrow. They're not thinking narrowly, they're thinking broadly. And we need to encourage that. And we, and I just want to say, Stephanie has picked up the mantle, she's running with it. She is in the tradition of everybody else that served in the 56, making sure people know that they have opportunities in what is coming down the pipeline. In 2017, we had our first cannabis conversation here in this building. Since then, a group has been meeting in this neighborhood almost monthly to discuss opportunities, collaborations, and innovation in cannabis. They have access, some of them have access to cash, some of them have, are, are the thinkers, some of them are the people who will be the doers. But what I'm going to say is that they would all qualify as social equity that would be in, that's in those rooms. And we have to remember that that's what, this, as varied as we are as people, that's who's in our social equity population. Because many of us who we, don't, who we look at on the street have been harmed in countless ways 
and we're going to let them tell us their story so that they can qualify. We're not going to say, oh, it's only if you did X or only if you look like Y. So that's what I think we've got to remember as we um, approach this. Jason Starr. He is onboarding right now and he will be leading our off the, I believe we call it the division, but it's the Office of Social Equity at the Office of Cannabis Management. And so yes, we are following a similar model, but it is directed for a statewide program because we do know and understand that if we are centering equity in this conversation, that we have to actually put resources behind it. So yes, thank you. Right. is to implement the law. We are not in a place of changing the law. If we want to see a change to the law, we're going to hand that over to the legislature. But at this moment, we are going to just implement the law, and we are trying to work on a definition of social equity that meets the goals that were intended when we passed the law. So I need to frame this this way. We have, for now, 52, 53 years had um, laws on the book against discrimination, yet it still persists. And a lot of times it persists in areas because people are tired of actually reporting what's going on. And so it is a fact, and a number of people know that this practice happens, but how many people that actually filed a complaint with a rights to commission with the state around any of these issues. We have to be the mirror in this. We have to, we want to, so first of all, I want to say this. I think that we are ahead of the game because we've put forth the fact that this is a social equity mo a model and who it's intended to serve, right? The four groups that we identified a little earlier. And so since everybody is aware of that, Anytime that we see that people are in a space where they are abusing that, we absolutely have to say something. Because we cannot continue to allow people to jump in ahead of the line when we know that this was, for 30 years, there have been black and brown legislators working on this. We cannot let all of that hard work go to waste and be in vain. So please, let's be very clear that your, your grandmother, whoever, your aunt Sue, cannot have 51% of your, um, your company because you want to be on the head of the campus line. One group that has um, clearly been identified to receive prioritization in the licensing process are those who have been arrested for low-level marijuana offenses. Wow. And part of the work of legalization was decriminalization, which began in 2019, wherein we started to uh, suppress and to um, expunge records. We got about 200,000 from that, legaliz that um, effort. And then when we passed legalization here in 2021, we have since March included an additional 200,000 more. So in New York State, we have currently expunged, suppressed, at least 400,000 people. Wow. Um, but they, and they make their, as they say, there are more that need to um, have their situations addressed. However, they are the one group that are identified to receive prioritization during the licensing period. And one of the concerns that we have is what information do we extract during our application process so that we are cognizant of the exposures that we're asking them to put themselves into. Got it. So yes, it is something that we're aware of. It is a consideration for us. And we, are, we think that the first step for us, though, was um, expungement. The Office of Cannabis Management is limited to cannabis. That's what we manage, that's what we do. The reinvestment 
it's a community. It sounds like a space where ideas related to what you're talking about might be explored, but I'm gonna say beyond that, I don't think that OCM has a hand to play in that. And I might be missing something. No, 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 I would just say that there are wonderful models around the country and that this is really a period where we can do all the research that we need to find something that speaks to what you would like to offer community. I visited a wonderful spot. We were there together in Bushwick just recently and I was amazed at what they, they were doing in that space. Um, and so, you know, New Jersey just um, legalized, so did Connecticut. I was in Atlanta um, last week for the National Black um, Caucus of State Legislatures. We had a whole panel discussion about ca um, cannabis and everybody came to that space. So there are so many models across the country that we really should explore during this time. And I'm sure that you're gonna find something that speaks to your spirit. So depending on how you wanna incorporate cannabis into your business, mm -hmm. you may just be obtaining a, new, a license that is going to enhance an existing business gotcha. versus creating a subsidiary business. Um, it, it, so that's the challenge of writing the business plan is to determine how you will be utilizing it. How you utilize it is completely up to you. The only thing we're examining is, is this a viable business applicant before us when we are distributing licenses? The people actually push this. They got that initial nudge that made the elected officials act. So what you're talking about is something similar to social justice campaigns that then forward the agenda. So that's gonna take the people pushing, um, the people that have been working on the ground to keep working on the ground and to keep making sure that there's referendums on the, these kind of initiatives, that there's actual strategic ad campaigns, that there's petitions around it. Because those are those things, you know, sometimes when people say that a lot of noise is made and they wonder if the noise has an effect and it does. You have to make the noise and grumble. And when the noise is made, you know, activities happen from that. I think education is extremely important in this space. I don't think it's enough of it. I think there's a lot of talk around business and not necessarily around the science behind the cannabis, how it affects the body, how, what, how people are using it, people getting the proper education into what's going into their bodies. And I think there's a lot of opportunity that's being left on the table because everyone is only focused on, you know, one aspect of the industry, growing or having the dispensary. You hear people say the same thing. I go to a lot of different conferences and forums and you hear people say the same thing. I want a dispensary. But there's the ancillary side of cannabis as well. There's a lot of services that are needed in the cannabis space to make sure that we have a healthy market. Cannabis is not new, but any emerging market is gonna be challenging in the beginning. So having to figure out you know, human resources, having to figure out how people are not gonna be penalized for using cannabis as a patient when it comes to getting job opportunities. So there's a lot of things that need to be worked out within the industry, but don't just look at it in one specific way. Hemp, you have byproducts of hemp, hemp fiber, hemp creep, that's gonna help on the real estate side and construction. There's so many different opportunities in cannabis that are being overlooked because people are looking at one way. So I think educating the community and making sure the community is informed is gonna be a very powerful tool in making sure that we have a healthy and equitable market. I know that um, there was an opt-out that was offered to um, counties and real estate um, owners and I wanted to know when was, I know the date changed, was it December 31st? It's December 31st. Oh, it still is December 31st. Okay, so what comes from that? Once you have a list of opt-outs, what is the next step? So we provided um, municipalities, towns, cities, villages, to opt out of um, retail locations, so they can opt out of having no, re they'll have no retail locations within their municipality and or consumption spaces. Those are the only two license types that they can opt out of. Legalization is statewide. And if you were growing in that, in that town, you could grow legally. The opt-out is only for those two license types. We're using that to help us determine the siting of licensees. That's what that's for, for OCM. For OCM, we need to know and understand what it looks like across the state, who's opted out of having those types of facilities, 
because we have to be mindful to make sure that opportunity exists across the state. Because as you said, we do need to make sure that people have access to products, and some people are self-medicating. Some people actually have medicinal cards like you. There, we just want to make sure that we are able to cover the entire state, so it's informational for us. Great. And have you heard of um, uh, real estate owners who feel like they are going to be charged federally? So I haven't heard that they're going to be charged federally, but I have heard that people are concerned what it might mean to their insurance and to their mortgages. And so those are real concerns for people who have obligations with institutions can, that cannot do business in cannabis at this time. So you need to be mindful of who and where you want to cite a business. Um, and you need to have the conversation with whomever the owner is to make sure they know and understand what the, your type of business is going to be if you're touching the plant so that they know what risks they're um, taking as well. This is just a conversation of risk. It's not a conversation of, I don't want to be a part of it. People assess risk consistently in business. Will the state offer a list of approved real estate? No, because that's not the no, area. I'm going to say, it's not about areas. It's So a town and a municipality identifies themselves if they do not want to have a retail space and or a um, consumption. And part of your application is an approval from the locality. So you will know if that's a space that's not open or willing to host your type of business, if that's what you want. Um, so we don't have to go and tell you that, you will know it because that's one of the things that you would explore in looking for um, approvals necessary to submit a completed application. But I will say we will do our assist people to come up with solutions for the challenges that they face. If it's us helping to figure out, and we are engaging with different insurers to help to figure out who's actually insuring cannabis businesses and who's not afraid to actually deal with them. And what we're finding is that largely they're providing life insurance but not, not business insurance. So those are challenges that are across the market. But we're just, I just want you to know, we're aware of it. We're not blind to it, and we are trying to work with our other parties to make sure we can tap into solutions as soon as they become available. Okay. So at this point, we are not pushing enforcement. We are pushing education. I'm with you. We have a job to educate our community as well as the legacy market so that they know that there's an opportunity to come into the regulated market. Right. So that's, I'm going to say, one of the primary goals of the work that we're doing over the next probably year and a half to two years. Um, we need to make sure that people know and understand that there is a pathway into this regulated market. So we do not have a, penal, a, a penalty system set up. We are talking to them and we are talking to law enforcement to let them know, yes, this is not, we have not legalized sale. We want to advise people to refrain from it, that gift exchange is not legalized. It is, we have not legalized that. I specifically made a statement during one of our board meetings to make it clear that, that gifted and suggested donations are not authorized. It is outside the scope of legalization. It is considered illegal at this point. So we advise people not to do it, and we try to help them understand how they can become legal. There seems point. to be a sentiment, thank you for that, there seems to be a sentiment though in the operators that are opening businesses and are stepping out of the shadows are considered legacy and are giving some sort of preference to actually gain licensure at some point. So we are not prioritizing people who went and oh, got their Hopefully you know, money out the bank and bought some real estate and now have a shop and they've been here for three months and they got they, they we're not talking to them. Them. The same dude that's opening for three right. months we're not, that's the last not, 20 years but I'm in the shadows, now I open a storefront, I'm stepping out of the shadows. That's like so, seeing, we have to look at, at jobs, education. So in defining what it is to be social equity and legacy, we are working on those definitions because honestly, those are very technical definitions that have left states open to countless months, even years of litigation. So when we say we haven't defined it yet, it's not to be cutesy, it really is because we don't want to put our foot in our mouths and end up in court. 
Fair we're enough. really trying to we are really trying to tackle it um, with, sen with sensitivity. And I don't want you to think that people who just open up a store are somehow believed to be the better legacy applicant. What we said with those who have been arrested are given prioritization. So just having a store that is not regulated does not give you priority. Of course. I am going to start the topic on social justice. And I want to hear from Ms. Mills in regards to the biggest challenges that you're that you're seeing in, in, in dealing with social justice in this topic specifically. Um, the biggest challenge that I've seen as far as social justice goes, uh, I see that there's a lot of the community that's misinformed or that we don't know. Um, I'll give an example. They just recently had a, uh, a black cannabis conference in New Orleans. Louisiana is a hot spot. There are, if you are black or brown, you are seven times more likely to be arrested for cannabis. And there are, there were many people that were unaware that the conference was going on, which would be an opportunity for them to be educated. And they did not even know that Louisiana would recently be criminalized. And it is things like that that I think is really harmful when it comes to the social justice aspect because people aren't aware. There are sponsoring clinics that go on. A lot of people don't show up because they don't know that, that it's happening. I was just in New Jersey uh, at a Canademics event in Newark at Rutgers University, and we were able to get 11 people's record expunged, but wow. that's just 11 people, even though that's still a great number, but it would have been more if people were even informed on what was going on in the community. So once again, education, and having more community events where we're talking to the people. A lot of the uh, cannabis conferences and events are focused on B2B. Everything is focused on business and profitability. There aren't really as many events that are directly correlated to the community, and you're talking to other cannabis people. It does not really serve the community to continue to talk to people who already know. We, we need to talk to the people who don't know and inform them because that way we can have more people on the ground when it comes to lobby days, when it comes to people influencing policy. People, you don't have to know how to write a bill, but you do, you can contribute to the language that goes into the bill that addresses these specific issues, most specifically criminal justice reform, because to me it doesn't make sense to decriminalize cannabis and still put people in jail. That's counterproductive to what the purpose is. Um, are there any programs or organizations you'd like to you know, um, speak up or Absolutely. let us know that so people can follow and or look into websites, Instagram, you know, just let, let us know. Yes, so you have M4MM, which is uh, Minorities for Medical Marijuana. They are an organization which is run by Roz McCarthy. That organization has been very instrumental in helping um, black and brown communities. They do uh, multiple expungement clinics. Canademics is another uh, organization. They are based out of New Jersey, but they work uh, with a lot of people from New York because of New Jersey and New York being so close together. And the tri-state area as a collective is, you know, everyone knows it's gonna be the biggest market in the entire uh, US. So. Those are just two organizations. You also have the, I think it's the Minority um, Cannabis Business Association. So there's several that are out there that you can definitely uh, connect with that will give you information as well as knowing where these events are happening. I just want to add um, that, you know, we, we sit here as a collective. Everybody has a role. Uh, in this new industry, and we have to take advantage of these relationships. Certainly, you all are boots on the ground, tin heels on the ground, and have access to those who've been most impacted. Um, and we certainly need to work together to ensure that we are bringing that information. Um, everybody is not going to read a brochure, I know that. So during the summertime, I was standing on corners, doing state of the streets, and having conversations with people um, about, again, not in crap hand. If you want to be in business, how can you do that? But I certainly agree with you. I think we need to, to have more of these, um, and not necessarily I love restoration. I'm upstairs, um, on the third floor, you can visit me anytime. Um, but we know that there, there needs to be barbershop conversations. There need to be coffee shops and bars. 
And um, I think that I'm one of those legislators that um, love to hang out in their district, so I'm, I'm willing to have these conversations uh, wherever the people are. Um, before, before you go, um, I, I just want to mention that this is a four-part panel, a four-part series um, in terms of the summit. One of the main things that we're going to bring to the table is the biggest thing that Ann and I have, um, have come in contact with is um, business writers. The, uh, the 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 um, writers of the actual application. Um, we come in contact with a slew of different um, uh, businesses that can help you prepare for this application. So we're going to bring a bunch of people that are that are business writers that are um, you know application writers. We're going to bring them here, government officials that can actually help you before the application comes out, so that you're prepared. Um, we're going to have forums, and so I just don't want you to think that this is it. The conversation continues after today. Um, can I add on something to sure. you? I want to add on to um, the expungement part. So, if you've ever been arrested before for anything, you should know what's on your rap sheet. Um, a lot of us, like, might have got arrested years and years ago, and we don't know what is actually on our rap sheets. So what it does is it impacts us from employment, from housing, from other different things. So it's always good to know, because even though automatic expungement took place through the marijuana law, some people still have those convictions on their records. And the reason, and the way they find out is on their record is when they're applying for a job and they're denied due to a background check. So if you've ever been arrested, once again, you should know what's on your rap sheet. Why? Because those things can prevent you from a lot of future opportunities. Can you tell, um, can you share how someone- Yes, so, so automatic expungement is supposed to happen. So now ultimately you have different organizations, which was mentioned, which was black led organizations, but you have the major organizations like the ACLUs of the world, the Brooklyn Legal Services of the world, the Bronx Defenders. You have all these different organizations who are working around expungement. Um, automatic, like, like I said, it's supposed to be automatic, but for some folk, it's still there. All that, as well as stealing. I worked on this work as, well, as far as expungement and stealing. If you've been convicted of a felony and it's a nonviolent felony, it's over 10 years old and you've never been rearrested again, you can get that case sealed. So it's a lot of different things you need to know once you've got a con criminal conviction um, that you need to know, period. So no, look at your rap sheet, request a copy of your rap sheet. You can get it from uh, where you got sentenced at, if you can remember, the district attorney's office, the court. You can appeal, it typically costs about $25 or so to get a rap sheet, but you should know what's on your rap sheet if you've ever been arrested. Because sometimes most rap sheets, about 70, 65 to 70% have identified errors. I'll say that again. Most rap sheets have errors. So that means that you might've got arrested for a DWI and it might say you got arrested for carrying a controlled substance. Mm. So it's good to know what's on your rap sheet. Stephanie, um, if I may ask, I believe you mentioned that either you're working on or there's some, something in the works for expungement to add on to what Roy stated. So I, I hosted an expungement um, event and we'll continue to, like I, I don't know if we'll be able to do the monthly, but at least bi-monthly we'll be able to host them. We've done them via Zoom and in person. Um, and then Community Services Society is another organization that has a next door, it's the next door project, and they are able to do um, expungements as well. So we think our, we're, we're so committed to it at the New York State Assembly that our majority leader, Crystal People Stokes, um, whose bill it was, um, actually has held an expungement event via Zoom from Buffalo. Uh, so this will continue. Here's a question about that. Well, I will say this, and, and I don't want to sound facetious when I say this, but th that would need to be another amendment. The reason why it took 30 years is that people really did not want to kind of 
any criminal involvement uh, as a part of this bill. And, and, and we fought uh, to ensure that low level was uh, And so if you've had you know, drug arrest attached with a murder conviction, that, that, that's, that's problematic. That did not make itself into the bill. So we have to continue to... Well, one of the things I will say to you is that we've got two great people, um, one on the Senate side um, and, and, and one on the and Patrice Walker, who is on uh, uh, the Assembly side. And, and, and they are two lawyers that you really should be in contact with and talk about what are the things that you would like to see. Um, because they have the, the power and they sit on the committee um, to push that agenda. But that's not currently a part of the current MRTA. Um, I don't think that the reason why that we are that space for those people who are arrested, they're arrested, their rights were taken away from them. They were not able to get jobs when they got out. So to make a, it seem like they should not get a chance to be in that space, it's a little bit of slap in the face because when you are in a lock behind bars and you don't know when you're getting out and at that time, what they were doing to, to black people was that they were giving them double the time that they were even supposed to have. Many of them didn't even have lawyers, so they couldn't even fight the system. So the thing is that the fact that they are getting the chance to be the first in, nobody should say anything about it. If you want to expand it and make it more, then you do so. But 30 years was fought getting it to this point because people didn't want to do it. And so if they have fought that fight, who are you to try and jump on and make it seem like you're supposed to have a chance to when you weren't fighting the fight to begin with and the fight wasn't with you. So it gets me a little annoyed when I hear stuff like that. I'm gonna calm it down and I'm gonna scale it back. But I am gonna say, when you have been in jail and you were a black or brown person, no one else has nothing to say about what is going on and who gets it and who doesn't. That's all I have to say. I would like to add to that, not to mention that cannabis was weaponized against black and brown communities. Well said. It was not just about arresting people, putting them in jail. We were targeted. It was over-policing. People, uh, Corbin Cooper is an example. This is a, a Score 40 Tons brand. It is another organization that has been providing expungement opportunities and getting those who have been arrested and that are out now getting them jobs. And he was serving a lifetime sentence and was pardoned uh, right before Trump left office. So you have someone who was doing life in prison over a plant and that are people who do far worse and they don't even get half as much time. So when you think about black and brown communities being impacted, understand that it was, it was a tool to oppress our community. And it continues to be a tool of oppression when you look at an industry that is legal, that is generating billions of dollars in tax revenue, which is the only reason why more states have been pushing to legalize because due to this pandemic, they have been bleeding money and they see cannabis as a cash cow for them to be able to generate more tax revenue, but yet decriminalize, continue to put people in jail, put in limitation that says, that, well, if you have this amount, then we'll still put you in jail. So if you're going to continue to arrest people and put them in jail and say, well, if you're over the legal limit or whatever the statute is, then they should limit how much you can sell and how much money you can make. But they won't do that. So I feel there needs to be more conversation about how we're going to prevent predatory practices in this industry that's going to continue to oppress black and brown communities. Well said. But it the justice advocates and those of us who are there and have had the experience because they live next door and have members of their families who have been impacted by this as well that's gonna keep pushing for it. But we know that the way things change is when people tell their story. Um, it's how we got our first black president, it's how we got any particular um, president. And so I can't say this enough, you know, before I was elected, I was heavily in the civic engagement space and it's a space that I still operate. And the thing that I work on with people is just trying to convince them how strong and how powerful their voices are. Um, and I know that people have this, you know, 
love and hate relationship with voting, but I absolutely tell you, in, in my lifetime, it, ha it has worked and it is the best tool that we have right now. But none of that works, and you don't get what you want um, unless you're, you're pushing every single day, um, you are getting commitments from your legislatures, and you are getting out there and making sure that you are voting the right folks into office. Um, and then, I always like to say this, voting is an invitation to have a relationship with your elected official. It is not the end. People vote and then they expect to get everything they want. It's like literally marrying somebody and showing up on your anniversary and saying, that honeymoon was trash, or I mean, I don't understand it. You have to have constant conversations with folks about what it is that you want. Um, and you cannot leave it up to uh, them to just determine just because you voted for them, because there are other people in their ear every single day, and there are other pressures around. And so we need to stay connected, we need to stay on the same page, advocates, um, those who are impacted, um, and legislators. Good question. Hi, um, my name is Takiya Young. I'm, a, um, I'm in this. I'm an uh, engineer by training, but an educator in practice and entrepreneur at heart. And I do a lot of work in the data space. And I do want to speak to you about what you love to hear from you all in your respective areas. How are you addressing data and the ethics of data? And this is already dealing with the ethics of data without this. But we know that that's some of the reason why some people are concerned because of tracking, you know, um, abuse of, and, and manipulation of data, as well as information and how it can be used against specific populations. So I want to know more about how you're either addressing or talking about data, what's shown up in individual spaces around data and the ethics. Uh, well, I, I come from, I have a tech background. So uh, technology, data, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a nerd. So I believe that there are platforms that are actually exist that are using aspects of blockchain to maintain privacy. There's a lot of talk about data and technology. And I know everybody's been hearing about crypto, and NFTs, and all these different things. But these are all tools in the tech space that can be utilized to help with that issue. I think that the, the same way that people want to be protected when it comes to what they opt in or opt out to, the same thing should be structured around cannabis because there are people that don't want to, you know, they don't want it to be known that they are consumers or even medical patients or they don't want it to, you know, be penalized you know, in the workplace for um, being someone who uh, consumes cannabis in any way. So I think that there is an opportunity there for someone like yourself or anyone else who is in that space to create those platforms that allow people to feel more comfortable with the information. The main reason why people are afraid is because of the stigma. The stigma is still alive and kicking very well. So the education that is necessary, I think, is going to help destigmatize cannabis and also give people those opportunities to make sure there are data platforms that are not predatory, that are not penalizing people. Anybody who's involved with cannabis that knows, you know, Instagram, they are crime on shadow banning you or you know you go to your page and it's there one day and the next day it's not but then you see people who don't look like us that are able to post tons of pictures and content you know of, you know a bunch of weed and things like that and then you have others that don't have that privilege so there definitely needs to be more platforms and there needs to be conversation in how we're going to make sure that data isn't used against people well, I would certainly um, want you to have a conversation with the folks at OCM because this has to be <laughs> uh, a serious, um, th there really should be a division that's dedicated to it given that what's at stake. Um, and <laughs> when, when I just think about the, 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 just what's happening with employment um, and what that's going to, how that is going to shift, um, I sit as the chair of, uh, um, on the subcommittee of Emerging Workforce. And so these are some of the conversations that we have. How is workforce changing? What are the new industries that people are going into? And, and data is, is, is one that um, we, we, we constantly worry about who's, who's, well, we don't worry about it because we know it's, it's, it's there. So we don't need to worry about something that is actually happening. We, we're constantly figuring out how to keep people safe, how to keep, keep people informed about the, um, the risk. Um, I have a new 
that are, that's going out this evening. They're just talking about what's going to be happening during the holidays. So we're not even talking about now add on this whole new industry and what people can use again against you to weaponize. So um, I certainly, you know, advise you to to, to reach out to um, to Jermaine and um, and sit down with your industry partners. I mean, I think it's probably really good if we have a roundtable um, discussion and a series of them because you know part of what we end up doing in the legislature if something goes wrong, but we end up having a hearing and we bring people before us on camera and talk about all the bad things that they've done and ask the questions. And then we've got to go and figure out an enforcement model. But I think this is an opportunity for us to really get ahead of it and amplify what some of the challenges are and kind of start to figure out what we need to put in place to address it. So. And if I could jump in with the modernization of the cannabis business, and I think what's going to be a positive for users of cannabis is that we're now going from street vendors that might have manipulated the product so now we're going to become something that's regulated and hopefully we're going to have a pure product. We're, not, we're going to have less of the overdoses and this is going to be something important with data. Like how much overdoses are we having from these kind of instances? Is it producing better, hopefully more, more better results with people becoming addicted or using this as what they consider a gateway drug? Because when I was young, this is where I, I speak some, from some of my experience, I used to smoke a lot of weed. I thought I couldn't get past smoking weed, and I did feel like it was something I was really hung on until I had a, a, a situation in my life where I couldn't smoke. And when I didn't smoke, and I saw my friends were when they smoked, and I thought of what was being put on the weed, because we buy weed from a guy on the corner, and we didn't know where it was coming from. You didn't know where this weed was coming from. So, so it's funny to think people are hesitant, and I don't want to bring the COVID thing into it, people are hesitant about a vaccine. But we bought dime bags from who knows where. We, we'd never see the guy again. So I think this does change it some because we're gonna be buying weed from reputable sellers, um, not some guy that's gonna disappear the next day. And if something does happen to people that are using this product, we know we have somebody to hold accountable for it. So I think that that progress and that tech part of it is gonna be a very big part of the legalization. just 13 years, from, 20, from 1920 to 1933, but the movement to uh, the temperance movement, if you would, started mid-century, 18th century, and it took them that long to get the prohibition in, in place. We are at a moment in time um, that culturally we are at complete, complete opposition with one another. Um, and so it is not, it's, it's going to take certainly the legislature um, putting forth policy, regulating those agent, um, agencies um, so that we are on one accord and we are messaging. But it is absolutely going to take everybody in this room to yell about it as well. We've had drug feed zones for I don't know how long, I don't know how long people have been infracted in those spaces. Um, Right, right now, we have an intergenerational conversation that needs to happen, and it needs to be a conversation and a dialogue. 
because you know I've got aunties that smoke weed and others that would be like, oh my goodness, that's the devil's um, uh, you know drug rising in um, in the house, and you're gonna ruin your life. We have to have to start those conversations. What's gonna be the role of the faith-based co um, community in this conversation, right? What is going to be for NYPD community, our justice advocates? We're going to have to lead that that effort because they're they're not automatically going to think about the fact that those are um, impediments to what we're trying to achieve by the decriminalization. Can I add on something real quick? Um, so first, let me say uh, it's crazy because we got to educate ourselves. You, you mentioned intergenerational, like a lot of our parents, a lot of our grandparents have that big stigma that we will never erase. I don't care how much they legalize it, we're not gonna erase it because they're just, that's their belief system. Um, I think ultimately, it's hard to hold media outlets or anything else accountable to what they say, basically living in a world after Trump. Um, so it's kind of hard to deal with that. But I think ultimately the education has to start at home. I think that we first have to educate ourselves to say, okay, yes, we might have started smoking weed for recreational use, but then we realized the medicinal benefits of it. How, wow, I notice when I get nervous, I smoke, now I'm relaxed. I notice while I'm dealing with a lot of pressure, I smoke, this happens. So we're realizing all the medicinal uses of it. But ultimately, the amount of harm that was caused will never, never, ever be dressed, addressed in our community amount of people and generations that have been going incarcerated for years just saying, oh, we legalized it and oh, we're going to give you a, a, a gateway to get in is not really the fix we want, ultimately. Um, I think that ultimately we have to be centered in educating ourselves first. Because ultimately, I always tell people this, because I've been doing criminal justice work for a long time, I believe that you have to first educate yourself and be on the same page from a language narrative because I believe there's a lot of language that needs to be shifted as well. When you're talking about marijuana, when you're talking about getting high, when you're talking about incarceration, I think a lot of emphasis has to go into the language of what you're talking about because ultimately the language is going to dictate the narrative that's going to come after that. So we, we have to address that language. I just want to add one thing. Um, but this one, we were using it before the, so, it's, before we were smoking, that plan has been around for a very long time, and we've been using it for a very long time. I'm talking about my I'm okay, I'm just saying, it's been around for a very long time. A lot of our grandmothers and great-grandmothers and such went into and got their roots and their weeds, and they took care of us long before we ever saw a Western doctor. And now they don't want to smoke no reefer. But again, the education, right? Marijuana was just one of the smoke. Marijuana was like the pistol stone out of the room. Marijuana was like the pistol stone out of the room. Marijuana was like the pistol stone out of the room. Marijuana was like the pistol stone out of the room. Right. And I just wanted to add to that. I was going to deny the caregivers. The education is important. I can't stop saying it enough. The reason why this stigma is so strong is because people have no idea of how beneficial we all have an endocannabinoid system. Everybody talks about just one, CBD. But you have over 100 different cannabinoids. There's tons of clinical research studies that speak towards the benefit of cannabis. I have a three-year-old daughter. My daughter is a heart transplant patient. I use cannabis for my daughter. She uses CBD and CBG. And developmentally, she's done amazing. She has had zero rejection in CBD. So for me, I've been able to see how cannabis affects you know, children who are born with chronic illnesses, adults. I see how cannabis has been used with people who have stage three and stage four cancer. These are all research studies that is available. Israel leads the entire world in research study for cannabis. And I think educating ourselves on what, how it affects the body, how the endocannabinoids affect us, and even getting to know your own endocannabinoid system and how the plant affects you specifically. You may not be a smoker. You may use a tincture, you may like edibles. There's all, so many different ways in utilizing cannabis and not just focusing on THC. People go into dispensaries and they want to be shown, you know, the bud tenders will show them what has the highest THC. Some people may need a lower dosage of THC and higher CBD. It just depends on what specifically 
that individual needs. Microdosing is extremely important. I think there needs to be a standard microdosing model, but that's only going to come from education to get doctors and physicians on board to be able to open that dialogue and have it where at some point they can prescribe things and they can create a regimen for individuals that need to or need to use it for different reasons. So I think it's really important for these conversations to happen and for community to be involved in because that's the only way you're going to start changing people's minds. Cannabis is used to get people off of hard drugs. So to call it a drug, that's where we need to stop first. It's not a drug, it's a plant and it has a lot of medicinal benefit. It's more than recreational use and that's why I don't really necessarily focus on adult use. Any way you use cannabis is beneficial to your body in different ways. So I think we should definitely start that conversation there and recondition people's minds and looking at cannabis as a drug and as a medicine. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Do you have a question over here? Yeah, I would like to advocate um, because I keep hearing the word education, 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 and I'm looking amongst the panel and I'm not seeing any educators, any teachers. Teachers have the widest span and within any community on any level. We're constantly interacting with parents, institutions, as well as policymakers and holders. And I really feel like that needs to happen. Are there any initiatives to create a cannabis curriculum? Are there any initiatives to do cannabis workshops? Are there any initiatives to even invite doulas into this conversation? There's a wide lens of um, birth education and family education and parenting education that maybe the traditional school model is it's failing because we notice that there is a lot of parent education that needs to happen because parents are constantly working and kids are getting falling through the gaps. So doulas and birth workers are really um, picking up a lot of that slack. But we're seeing with the current legislation with doulas, we're just now coming around to the fact that black maternal health is a huge dire issue that's affecting our community. We're losing black mothers in the birthing process. We're losing black mothers in a lot of the, the illnesses that come up, up within um, pregnancy. And not even just, you know, not even just mothers, but to be exclusive of the LGBTQ community, birthing people. People who are getting pregnant, people who want to pursue families, whether you're even a surrogate, there are issues and complications that come with that. And sometimes cannabis is a way to alleviate those illnesses. But if you are in a hospital or sometimes even in a birthing center and you are tested for um, drugs and you're, you, not the child, you are showing up with THC in your system, you lose your child. You lose your, if you go into a check-in system, if you're not even birthing, if you go in for a GYN checkup and they even suspect or even have any idea or smell or whatever that you are using cannabis or someone calls an ACS case on you because you maybe have rheumatoid arthritis. I have a very dear friend of mine who she was called ACS on her, but this woman has debilitating rheumatoid arthritis to the point where she can't even get out of bed and raise her children and she is a considerably young woman. She's 36 years old. And she lost every, she lost all three of her children. So what do we do in those situations where parents are trying to parent? Where teacher, teachers don't get drug tested. That's a big, that's another big, you know, misnomer and propaganda that is going on around cannabis. Oh, you can't be a teacher and engage in cannabis. Almost every colleague that I've worked in for my 15 years of education, we all consume cannabis. DO, public school DOE, charter, teaching artists, professors, all, all throughout the education field and industry. So what are we doing to really include those two populations to make sure that our community at large, because families are getting hit the hardest. Right, um, and I come from that. I'm, I was, you know, I'm a black woman. I've been in health disparities in this country. Uh, I didn't find out about my daughter's heart condition until she was, uh, I was seven months pregnant. I never knew that children could be born with heart disease. Yet, <coughs> heart disease is one of the most common universal types. And the mortality rate is 60% higher than every single pediatric cancer on heart. So that statistic alone let me know there's a lack of education and communication for the medical community as a black community. So I chose to be an advocate to let black women know that this does exist. These are questions you can ask, these are things that you can ask, you know, ask your doctor and ask your child is born to make sure you're not taking a baby home that has a heart condition to where if they stop breathing or their nail tips are blue or you notice their lips are blue or purplish in color, that there's a real problem going on. So those are things that are very much important and there is cannabis curriculum. There are people who are teachers. There's cannabis nurses. There, there are nurses who are actually certified to 
should be able to educate in cannabis. There are doctors. If you don't know of the Knox docs, please Google Rachel Knox or the, the Knox family. They are doctors that actually have a cannabis clinic in Oregon. There are other doctors out there that are working with the cannabis community as well as trying to educate and work with current doctors who don't have that education. So there is curriculum out there. There are classes you can take. There are certifications you can take to become an endocannabinoid specialist. And there are courses for doulas to be able to learn how to incorporate that into their education. So it's still being built. And that is something that the National Cannabis Party is actually working with universities. Right now we have 73 universities that have accepted us to be able to start working with the student population and to try and help create curriculum in these universities. And we have quite a few HBCUs as well that are signed on to be able to create that kind of program. And but just to add on to um, your point, as Corin mentioned, we are building out three additional sessions like this, and one of them will cover education. Um, just like a lot of people in this room, we're learning, we are curious, things are coming to life every day, and that's definitely something that we said that we want to touch on. Educators, doctors, the programs, to bring that information to New York City, because since you know we are getting into that market, but in the next year or two, there are other markets that are well more advanced than we are, and advocates like the Knox family, which is things like the mother and father, like T.A. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a whole family. Um, and there are others, but they are like the pioneers of the education, the medical education component. So we are going to build that out. And um, shameless plug, but if you guys follow us, um, to Chicks and Flowers, uh, we will bring all the information and all the panels, all their information will be on there. So this is something we're going to build. In the next year, we're going to take a year while we're waiting for the regulations from the OCM to bring more information to New York City um, civilians. Hold on, do we have a question in the back? That's a great question. Um, and so you all know, let's see if you have my brochure, um, but that currently smoking while driving is illegal and it is an offense under DUI. Um, but you cannot stop anyone legally because you think you smell smoke or you saw smoke, right? Because it could be cigarette smoke. Um, that is where we are right now, but you and I both know that this is one of these things that we're going to be um, serious advocacy on, right? And we're going to have to work very closely with OCM to ensure that we are being very clear about the regulations. Um, and, and certainly, what else are we going to need to do as they roll out those regulations as a legislator, um, legislature, to figure out are there additional provisions that we need to put in the law to ensure that NYPD um, aren't returning to the, um, and I'm, that's a misnomer too, right? So legally, there's no stopping for us, right? Um, but again, this goes back to culture, right? There's a culture in that department that we're all trying to impact, right? We're clear that black and brown people have borne the brunt of every um, violent, traumatic incident that you can think about when it comes to a force that was designed um, for, on paper, to protect all citizens, right? And so this is really one of those spaces that we're going to have to dig deep and, and, and put forth what we want to see. What does the behavior look like? What, does, what, what are you legally able to do? And then what is your boss telling you when you, you all show up to work and you're getting your assignment for the particular, um, for the particular day? Um, we've got to be absolutely transparent about what's going, what's going on now. 
Um, so I have three precincts that I'm responsible for. I can talk to, I, I can, I've had conversations with each of those inspectors, and I know what that they are telling their beat cops, their NCOs, their community affairs or officers about um, drug stops in our um, neighbor in our neighborhood. Um, that I can't control what happens in Albany and 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 other counties, um, but it, it it literally starts here. And I think that we have been building toward a model of what what policing with community looks like. Um, and we need to we need to tell that story. Um, you know, the hardest thing has been through all of this is to deal with the trauma that people have we're dealing with national from. George Floyd to Tamir Rice is still the one that gives me, um, just takes me out. Um, and a lot of that gets conflated in what's happening here. But I, I think that we have done a really good job of having constant conversations with NYPD about what policing looks like in this particular neighborhood. Um, and people have to be brave enough to, to not only talk about what it is that we want the police to do, but then also what we're willing to do as well. Um, because people talk community policing, but I've had a difficult time getting people to actually take responsibility of what does that really look like on the on, on, on your block, right? If you can't talk to somebody about their loud music um, or the block party, um, how are you gonna talk about um, crime reduction? Um, we have to get to a place where we are resolving conflict so that we're not over abusing NY, uh, 911. I don't know the last time I called 911, because I'm gonna have a conversation with you about what's going on in my block and in my neighborhood. We have, to, we have to do that while we're pushing back on what they have been doing consistently. So I think we need a list of demands about, well, I won't say demands, we need to have a list about what policing looks like in our neighborhood before and after MRTA. And we've gotta, we've gotta have consensus because one of the things that we don't have is consensus. Some people are talking about defunding police altogether. Some people are like, I need my NYPD. Um, we have to have that community that dialogue and figure out what is it that we need and what do we want to see happen. Um, I hope we get to a place where we are not having to call 911 for, for everything. If somebody's having a mental health um, a breakdown, then we're calling those peer support people, the hospital personnel to come and see about that. And we're having conflict. We want to call the Peace Insti Institute and not NYPD. NYPD. There are all of these different models um, that we've been looking at, but now it's time really to implement those things um, because if we don't, we are going to see um, the same sort of behavior that we've um, all lived with during this time. So just to jump on that, for that question. To jump on that, that is going to really go into uh, maybe revisiting our behavior behind it because with it being more available and also being legal to purchase and and smoke. If the young men in the neighborhood that we're very, um, we're very serious about watching over, if they begin this, this, these activities of smoking in the car, now this also breeds another industry because you know there's industries all around the cannabis use. So now this leads to young men being incarcerated, young men um, falling victim to car accidents from it. So it's going to have to be very responsible behavior and also com community policing of it. Of what is the behavior we're going to be. Um, taking part in with this new legalization of cannabis. Let me add on, can I add on something real quick? I think, I think that question is kind of hard to answer. The reason why is because we're on the cusp of a new administration coming in. I'll say that again. We're on the cusp of a new administration coming in. So all contingent on how the next mayor decides to do policing is contingent on whether you get pulled over for smoking or not, really, in a way. So I don't even think you really can, it's kind of hard to answer the question because if there's an overarching heavy hand because of the rise of shootings that's happening all around the city and they start cracking down on people driving, then everybody falls in that web. We know that as people of color, how to work in this country. It's a web that gets created and it swallows up everybody. If you stop stopping first, if you start it again, people want crime to go down, they think stopping first is the answer or broken window policing, whatever you want to call it. What happens is a lot of innocent people are going to get stopped, harassed, arrested, as well as pulled over, arrest, arrested, all that stuff is going to happen. So I think it's, gonna, it's a hard question to act, answer 
with the new administration coming in and not knowing how they're going to go about policing. Let me jump in. I want to remind you that there's two new administrations going in. The mayor is the executive, and he does hire and control the police department, but the city council is responsible for writing the laws and dictating what they can do legally, right? And then I'm, I, I, I have to stress this. The rest of it is up to us. Because all of those people who sit there, those 51 people there, the 150 that are on the state level, we are all responsible for listening to our community and setting forth policies that's going to keep us all safe. And so it is, it is your voice that is going to continue this happening. Let me say, let me say something too. So we have two brothers here sitting right next to each other. We do both do work in the community, and I, I do think, that although with the, how the administration looks to do their form of policing is going to be one aspect, I do think the behavior in cars and smoking is going to be a very big thing because going into a car and smoking, as Stephanie said, we're we're beginning the we're beginning of a whole new industry. There was times where people used to drive and drink a beer. That was very common very common until we understood how terrible of an act that was. So now with this cannabis coming Now we got red cups. Well, well, hopefully we don't. Hopefully we don't. <laughs> example, I'm the same example because, like. Because likewise, it's, it's not a good act to do. And this right. goes on to the community part. So me speaking to young men, my thing is gonna be, you don't want to, you don't want to entertain any of these activities while in a vehicle. And it may seem culturally acceptable. And it's really not. It's really not. I would just counter as an educator with a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you tell a student or you tell a child, you tell a human being with the psychological process of a brain not to do something, what is the alternative behavior? That's understood, but there are laws for a reason. And now we may not want them to, we may not want to say, hey, you can't do this, but understanding we have to say that. Because if we don't, culturally, if we don't, then we have the same thing where we're breeding in the industry your, where we have point, a bunch sister, of But to your point, but to your point, you're right. Alternatives have to happen, right? right? And so, where the consumption spaces are going to be. So maybe we have a culinary class and we start instituting, okay, culinary cannabis, infused cannabis activities, and then creating more of a demographic that is prepared for the industry. Because as you have a lot of you know stay-at-home moms that want to do infused cookies, bakery and pastry and things like that, and then culinary is an activity that is now being seen as a viable resource within high school community. So maybe we, if we take this one activity, with, but we replace it with something that is productive and still creates a stream of wealth for the children as well as for the industry. That's that's the point that I'm making. Don't tell them don't do, and then not create another activity for them to do. Okay. That's the only thing. Okay. okay. We're going to take one final question, and then we're going to have a final. Oh, we have two questions. We're going to ask you to so a minimum, and then we'll have final thoughts. First yes. question. Okay, um, first of all, thank you so much for our great uh, group of panelists. Uh, I'm a licensed physician for the state of New York and the state of New Jersey. And the first first thing I would like to, to talk is, I'm an advocate for patients, and uh, we really haven't talked much about them. Uh, they are the ones that are, keeping us here united. Uh, you don't imagine the amount of times that I have convinced patients, uh, very ill, very sick patients in the verge of death, uh, to try cannabis. I've been, uh, I've been recommending cannabis for the last four years. And once I convince them, they cannot get it because it's too expensive. So uh, living on a paycheck or social security uh, having to pay a thousand dollars a month, um, it's, it's it's impossible. So so I, I would like to to mention them because I think they they are uh, why we are here. And and second of all, I would like to uh, to uh, suggest to stop using the word marijuana. Marijuana is uh, we are perpetuating racism by using that word. And uh, me as a part of the Spanish community. Uh, we were, uh, uh, we as and, and Mexicans were, were criminalized as well uh, using that word. So, 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 uh, yeah, patience should be number one, number two, and number three. Thank you. Thank you. Final question. Back. Yeah. We, we got it. We got.
I agree. I agree. I'm sorry about that. And that, that is something we touched on. And I do think it becoming legalized. We don't want it to be something that we overstep. We, we go past that. And we lose a lot more people to it than we um, anticipated in the beginning. But I'm sorry. Go ahead, Stephanie. Well, what I would like to say is that I would like to have the medical personnel here to have this that conversation, um, but it is one of the reasons why regulation of the industry is so important. And it's like anything. Anybody that is is going to um, start to consume anything that they're not familiar with and they don't know how it's going to impact them, right? Some people are allergic to avocado, so going back to this is not necessarily um, a drug, right? Um, it has medicinal properties, it's a plant, um, but I can't eat apples unless they heat it up, right? And so that's a natural thing. And so as you introduce any new substance into your body, you should always test it out before you do so. You should have the conversation with your medical professional. The problem, based on what you're describing and what Syriac really is, you know, very concerned, and rightly concerned, because you know, we, we live through the K2 epidemic and other epidemics that have happened in this community. So it is, uh, you know, top of mind for us. But it is it, because people aren't thinking about their ingestion. And, and, and again, not just with this, um, with, with cannabis, but just whatever we do. So we want people to be educated about the foods they eat, the creams they use, what they smoke. Um, we want them to use it judiciously until they figure out how their body reacts to it. Um, and I think th that's how we deal with people having these adverse reactions um, or getting into situations where they, they can't handle it. We come, we, from a, we have a society right now, we're binging, right? We binge watch, we binge drink, we just binge, right? And we really need to move away from that and really to start thinking about our bodies as temples and what enters that space and how we enter that space. So I'm looking forward to the conversation um, with, with, with doctors because this is, you know, it, it's a number one issue. I hate pill boxes because older adults take anywhere from seven to 10 pills a day. And they're not getting any better. And so we have a we have we have a problem that we need to um, address, and it's not just around the MRTA. Thank you. All right, final thoughts, what? Oh, uh, um, I think that I think that first, thank you, thank you both, thank you. Can we give a hand round of applause? Two chicks and a flower. Thank you for creating this. Thank you for being visionaries and like. Picking the space, this place, because Central Brooklyn, everybody know where Restoration Plaza is. Um, I will say this in, in closing, because I'm a criminal justice advocate. I've worked in this work for 10 years or so, started nonprofits and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, the, the thing I've consistently done is advocate for people. And I believe that when we start putting people first over profit, people first, over everything else, business and everything else, I think that we will then meet people and address the harms that were committed for all these years. Um, but ultimately, educate yourself. It's public information, you can Google all this information that was talked about tonight, you can go on Google and find out what it costs to be a cultivator, what it costs to be a distributor or grower. Like, this is all public information. It is coming. So part of this form is like a, it's a precursor to what's about to come. As a heads up, New York is supposed to be different, and I'm hoping and praying, and I'm holding you to your word, um, Andrew, uh, that New York will be different than any other state because we've heard it all so many times before. It's going to be different here, but ultimately, we hope that it will be. Thank you. Syriac, can you find one? Yes, um, sitting here, I see that a lot of my business is, um, is shaped by my mission as a mentor and how these how these situations are going to affect some of the young men that I work with. One in how it can adversely affect them and how it can positively affect them, where they'll be smoking, hopefully clean the weed, but also adversely like what kind of lifestyle and cultural shifts are going to adjust them as they're growing up. So 
It's something I think you definitely need to stay aware of and pay very close attention to because with this new industry, it's going to come new issues. Ms. Mills? Um, my, my final uh, closing thought is um, for everyone to be intentional in this case. Uh, in the cannabis industry, as we said, so much is focused on profit that we forget about the people, we forget about the patients, we forget about the whole reason why the you know, cannabis has been a great unifier in our people that utilize cannabis. And I think that if we need this attention and make sure that we're building like strong and powerful communities through education, you know, through coming together and, and helping one another because, you know, so there's always going to be someone that knows more than you do. So getting with those people and bringing all those brilliant minds together is going to be able to help us to create opportunities. Whatever you do not see in this space, you have the power to create. You don't have to wait for legislation. You don't have to wait for your officials to get together. As a community, you get to decide what is best for you. I, I strongly encourage that because I get tired of hearing, you know, all of this talk about how they're going to reinvest in communities through the tax revenue or how they're going to treat social equity. Social equity is not a project. And it's being treated treat it as a project based instead of really getting to the root why it's necessary and why there really needs to be conversation about diversity and inclusion. So I think that us coming together, bringing our ideas together, and collectively understanding what our communities need and telling them, telling the people who are in positions of power because you put them in, and making them accountable and making sure that there is transparency in how this process works so that the community has a better understanding of how to help push the legislation and policy that's going to help you. Instead of telling, letting people tell you what's best for your community, be a voice and amplify your own voice and yourself to say, this is what we need because this is how the war on drugs has impacted us and this is how our neighborhoods are suffering so that there can be the right programs that are put in place. That was a mic drop. Did you want to say anything else? Um, other than the fact that I too want to just thank you for this forum. Um, I, I've helped several myself. Um, uh, this by far has been, you know, the, the most engaged in terms of the questions, and it absolutely has to continue. Um, we need to stay connected. You too need to stay connected. Um, ask questions. Utilize my my, my office. Um, Send me an email, DM, whatever you need to. If you have a question that you didn't get a chance to ask this evening, um, uh, she's absolutely right. We are going to write the next chapter together, uh, but that's gonna that, that's going to uh, require that we stay in dialogue with one another, that we're honest with one another, that we're um, talking about our lived experiences, but also sharing our hopes and dreams. Right, because this is not just about what's happening here, what we've seen before. This industry, this time is so vast, we don't know where it's going to end up, right? But we've got some real problems that we want to uh, address. Certainly, the cost of this, whether or not um, people will be able to um, uh, pay for this using their insurance, um, who will have access, who will be monitoring it, whether it's the data or the police. All of these are factors that we have to take into account, and we need all eyes and ears and hearts and minds united to make it happen. So, thank you again for being here, and I look Please forward to the clap. next one. Thank Bye. you. Okay, on a final note, I would like to thank everyone. We would like to thank everyone. I forgot what kind of married. Um, we'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight, everyone that's watching on Zoom and on live. We Really feel very overwhelmed as well as appreciative that we are being welcomed into the space um, that we have been affected by indirectly as women of color growing up in an urban environment. We would like to thank all of our panelists, um, Assemblywoman um, Stephanie Zimmerman, um, Madam Chairperson of the Cannabis Board, Ms. Mills, National Cannabis Party, um, Syriac, 500 Make a Difference, and Boy Waterman. We also would like to thank all of our sponsors. This event was completely free. We wanted this event to be free. We wanted to include everyone. We didn't want it to be a situation where you had to pay anything. Um, and it was made possible by way of sponsors. Um, all of the sponsors are in the back of the booklet. We ask you to follow, to support, to tell a friend, 
Um, some are small businesses, some are major brands, but that's the only way that we can continue to bring new free events if we help them one way or the other. Tell a friend to tell a friend. Um, we would like to give a couple of notable thank yous. Um, first, we would like to thank Marlon Rice for offering space and collaborating with us to put together the first event. Thanks, give a clap. We would like to thank Colette Boston. She has been very instrumental in the media part of this, as well as Carol Rodeck. We would like to thank Ty Noel. She has been instrumental in the back. She is our creative director. Talk of the Town, excuse me. Talk of the Town, who is um, currently Zooming, um, streaming this event for us, um, live streaming. Come on, you guys. And we will keep you guys updated via our social media sites. Um, I would thank you so much.